Welcome. I like to call this series Tales from the Lone Salesman, where I talk about topics that I'm interested in or just if it's life, whatever. So today we're going to be talking about Godzilla's singular point or Kojira Singure Pointo. This is a new anime that came up. It's a it's a, it's a Netflix exclusive, and it's also airing live in Japan. So, um, there was a Godzilla anime series also on Netflix and aired in movies here in Japan, but they were uh, not that great. I didn't like them at all. So when I saw this anime, I was a little worried. I'm not gonna lie. I was like, what? What is this? So uh, if you guys don't know, I'm a huge Godzilla fan. I got tattoos. You know, I even got the toys here. This is one I got when I was a kid. Godzilla 1990s version. Here's my favorite right here. Mecha Godzilla. And for audio listeners, this is the got Mecha Godzilla 1975 design I'm holding. It's a coin bank. I love it. When I first heard about this Godzilla singular point anime. I was worried. Okay, because the last three movies that came out, not the American ones, there was actually three animated movies, if you didn't know. Um, they were horrible. I I I I couldn't I couldn't watch it. Well, I watched it, right? So I watched the first one on Netflix, and then the other two I watched in theaters in Japan. They actually aired in theaters here in Japan. And I, I didn't like them. Um, the first one was okay. It was kind of like a cool sci-fi space adventure with the added element of Godzilla. And uh, I felt like they, they did that one right. The second one just felt like a filler anime. The third one was just, was just crap. When I heard this new anime was coming out, I was a little worried because I didn't know what they were going to do with it. So I started seeing the art design. I, you know, I got the poster up here, and I was, I was intrigued. And I said, okay, so we got Gojira Singular Point, or Godzilla Singular Point, or in Japanese, Gojira Singular Pointo. So I was like, well, what, is it, what do they mean by that? Like, it's just such an odd name. And the character designs, too, I was like, uh, I wasn't really feeling it, right? So I, I just didn't know how to feel about this. And then... I watched the first episode. It was on Netflix, and uh, it was in only in Japanese. So I know, um, actually, the show isn't available internationally right now. It's only available on Netflix, uh, Japanese Netflix, or I know it's airing on television as well. I watched the first episode in Japanese, and I had mixed feelings about it because, one... I couldn't understand the exposition because it was all in Japanese. And two, um, the characters were not what I expected to be in a Godzilla movie. So normally characters aren't that that full in Godzilla movies. Um, even in the American ones, you know, I don't really watch the movies for the characters, but I was actually surprised as the series went on. Uh, each character kind of has an interesting uh, thing to do or add to the story, I guess. So I wanted to start off with uh, some general impressions of the show. So for this, I didn't want... So I know everyone hasn't seen it yet, and I know some people have. You know, if you just use a VPN, you can watch it. Uh, the last episode's actually coming out in a few days. So um, I think what I'll do here, since we're doing a live session i'm just going to start with my impressions and then give a brief overview of the show in general so first off the theme song is actually pretty nice i like it um the the images slashed gives me uh reminds me of evangelion just like the crazy scribbled writings like the ravings of a madman mixed in with uh the characters walking Get the silhouettes walking and then the the rock song. I, I would play it, but you know, it's I don't know the music. It got it caught my interest. It it doesn't play the first episode, but it plays on the second one. There's a running theme in most Godzilla movies. Uh they treat they treat most of these movies, right? Or uh Godzilla itself, the monsters, like a 
national disaster. And if you watched uh, Shin Gojira, that was probably one of the more realistic adaptations of uh, some of the older movies where it's just a group of people in a room figuring out how to take care of Godzilla. And then it shows like the fake newscasters and then, you know, the extras running from the monster. And there's a lot of that in the series where it shows you uh, not only like the news, but it also shows like Twitter feeds and like social media, what people are posting about. Uh, so every episode when something happens, it usually gives you like a, a few scenes where the news is reporting or the social media. So I like that because that was always something I liked about Godzilla is because uh, they, they always take the situation very seriously. It's not like totally drastically fantastical. It's like, okay, what do we do if this actually happens? You know, like what's going on? There is like a little bit more backstory here in this show. So one thing they kind of did different was they mixed Godzilla and the kaiju into uh, Japanese folklore. So all the all the monsters are like they're all mostly three D models, but they're if if you look at the poster here, not quite this one. I, I don't want to spoil the monster designs because if you haven't seen it yet, it's it's better if you see it firsthand. But the monster designs are very uh, inspired from old style like Japanese drawings. So. If you've ever seen like the dragons or like the carp or the kappa monsters or like the you know stuff like that it's kind of like that so um even godzilla's design like the design here on the poster um he doesn't initially uh appear like that he actually has a few more forms that uh were a little off-putting when i first saw them like i i didn't really like it at first i was like really this is what they're doing with godzilla and um, I was like, yikes. So I was a little worried at first. So basically, the way the show starts out, without giving too much away, they're doing a festival and they show this beautiful uh, picture of, you know, it's what looks like a uh, giant like sea monster riding with these uh, pterodactyl looking creatures, which and then like a Japanese like old school samurai with the archer. And it's the, the pterodactyls are actually Rodan. So if you don't know, if you're a fan of the series, you know, Rodan's a very famous, you know, he's like a pterodactyl, but, you know, wind, his high gust wind powers and all that. So he's well known. I think they gave that away in some of the trailers. So that's not much of a spoiler because he's pretty much one of the first monsters that appears. And uh, the other one that's, you know, prevalent here is uh, Jet Jaguar. So... Um, let's talk about Jet Jaguar for a minute because there's a little history behind him. This is the design. I'm going to move this. This is the design they went with. I'm going to move this over here. Yeah. So anyway, this is the design they went with, right? So the face is pretty much identical to what they went with uh, in the original where he appeared in Godzilla vs. Megalon. Um, the backstory behind Jet Jaguar, well, before I go into that, um, he's a little awkward. Uh, the bottom design, you know, sometimes he has legs in this one. Um, there's different configurations through the show in this one, but the body mainly, uh, stays the same. So in this one, he can be piloted. Uh, later on, he gets some upgrades where the cage isn't there, where he gets bigger, um, or he gets a special weapon. And um, where this character came from, I'm just going to pull up this one first. So this is the original. You can't really see it that well. This is, so this is the original design of Jet Jaguar. And guess who designed this? It wasn't Toho Studios. It was actually for a contest. A child actually drew this. I, I don't have the name, but uh, it's a pretty famous story. But child drew this what he ended up turning out to be was this so still a goofy design but you got to understand that uh the original movie during the time uh you know ultraman was popular so 
from the drawing, this is what they came up with, you know. And he, held, you know, him and Godzilla end up fighting two other monsters. Pretty much, yeah, he's like a Tin Man, but it's goofy. But I, it, it was cool. Like, you know, there's a there's a famous moment where he's, you know, he shakes hands with Godzilla. For me, it was just a, it was, a, it was just an awesome moment. Bam! Here we go. All right. I mean, look look at that. I mean, to me, like that's just such a goofy, silly moment. Like, I don't know. Uh, seeing Godzilla shake hands with some, like this was a period of the time when the Godzilla movies were just cheesy and kind of made for kids, and they just stopped caring. Kind of. I mean, I, I mean, they didn't stop caring, but you know, it's dope, right? I mean, look at them, like. I want I want to shake hands. Imagine a drawing you made and then, you know, seeing that creation come to life. And then he's like fighting, you know, he's taking hands with Godzilla and then he's, you know, fighting another monster. Like, I think as a kid, you know, you'd probably freak out. So anyway, that's that's kind of where Jet Jaguar comes from. He comes from uh, he was only in one movie. That's where his origins come from. He's. uh so I thought it was cool that they decided to add him in this uh, adaptation because they've never really used him before, except for like in games. And um, that's about it. Like he's in a few games. So uh, in this, he is owned by the Otaki factory factory, which is owned by this man right here. So this is Otaki Sato, which owns the otake factory company so he's not the main character but he basically um he's an eccentric old man crazy genius he designed the uh the robot itself jet jaguar but he didn't design the actual programming so he's got this cool like fighting spirit kind of like um very old school, you know, like uh, part of his design, he wears a um, a charm from like one of the shrines, like uh, something you'd buy at a shrine. You know, he wears that and, you know, he's got the traditional shoes and he's always like, you know, let's go get that kaiju. Like he's ready to fight any kaiju. doesn't matter how big he's like, you know, let's go get him. And so uh, it's, it, he's like admirable, you know, he's trying to fight him. And there's this scene in... Um, in the first episode that caught my eye where he's dueling the Rodan and he does this move that's famous in like Kabuki theater, you know, where he's like, you know, like this and like this. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I, I should have saved a picture, but um, it caught my eye because they obviously have an appreciation for like old school theater. So they added that in to this character when he was fighting. So, I thought that was interesting. And um, going on to the main characters here, we have, I'm going to pull up Yoon. So he's um, basically uh, another genius, but more on the technical side. And he, you know, helped write the programming for the robot or for JJ or Jet Jaguar. And he's kind of like very witty, you know, so between him and the other characters, he's probably one of the more intelligent ones. So uh, the other members is with him is Haberu, also known as uh, Barbell. He's kind of more grounded. He's kind of like your... If you didn't know what was going on, this would be you. Like, he's strong. That's about it. I mean, he's he's nice, genuine. You know, he'll he'll get the job done. But he's kind of like your character where, you know, all the other smarter characters are explaining stuff to him because he doesn't really know what's going on. But uh, besides him, if we're going to talk about the Otaki factory people, the last one we have is uh, Satomi. Um, there's not much to this character, to be honest. I mean, she's kind of got a cool design. She's like a goth. Uh, she works at the factory. That's about it. Like she, she kind of fell flat for me. 
she just works there. She's that's kind of her character. It's kind of funny, like because you know, uh, out here in Japan, you see girls like that at like the convenience stores working. Like it's like their part time job. So she kind of reminds me of some girl who just wanted like a part time job or any job, and she just works there. But the main reason I'm talking about the characters is because. Uh, the show moves really fast and it's only 13 episodes and there's a lot of exposition between it. So um, probably in a different one, I, I'll talk about like what actually happens in the story. So um, I won't get into all the characters, just some of the main ones. Um, that's the Otaki Factory crew. Um, they're pretty simple. And then lastly, I will talk about... May. So May is our other protagonist. So between the show, it's basically Yoon and May in different parts of the world doing different things to solve this mystery. So what what starts this mystery is this mysterious song that's played that creates a signal that uh awakens the monsters, pretty much. Uh, there's more to that later on and explains, but uh, she is another genius scientist. You know, she's got all these theories. It's a very obscure, like major, but now it's relevant in this hunt to, you know, figure out what's going on with these kaiju. So um, those are the main characters Basically, what I want to summarize here about the show is it's it's not like your typical Godzilla movie. I'll, I'll just say it like that. Um, it's got a lot of elements like uh, if you like Shin Gojira, you could tell that they picked up a lot from that. Um, Godzilla kind of goes through this transformation as he did in Shin Gojira as he uh, evolved. And that's kind of what they showcase here. And on that added element, there's a mystery behind, you know, where these monsters came from and their powers. So I kind of like that element. I wasn't sure about it at first. And you know, as I was taking notes, it helped me kind of remember, you know, what's going on. Because uh, otherwise, I mean, the other elements of the show, like the humor, um, there's some attempts to be like kind of artsy or poetic where they quote a lot of... Uh, old poems and um mix in that it it's whatever i mean it's not that clever to be honest i mean maybe for like if you're a foreigner or like for japanese people maybe it might be interesting because they're quoting a lot of uh, american poets and european stuff so it's a little interesting but for me it's like eh. um the humor is mainly with this uh, ai robot that kind of helps along with the show and I don't like them too much. Uh, they're funny sometimes. Like there's some interesting things like one of the main elements of the show is explaining how MD5 hash works. And if you don't know what MD5 is, it's basically a hash cipher to encrypt stuff. So um, they kind of give a funny explanation about that, which I thought was a little clever. There's a lot of supernatural elements mixed with the future and past, also with science fiction. So uh, some of the explanations are a little interesting, like outside the box. I I haven't really listened to something like this and given it much thought like I did. Like in Evangelion, um, the science and what they explain almost feels real. And then you kind of get that in the show, too, where when they're explaining stuff, you almost feel like it's, it's like real life. I mean, it's, that's what science fiction is. Good science fiction really makes you like think about, Oh, could this actually happen? Like, I don't know. The show has these opposing factions, uh, these companies and then the governments. And that it's a bit hard to follow. I will say that. So that's why in a later follow up video, I'll talk about a plot because it gets a little confusing between uh, these two companies. Well, we know the Otaki factory. We talked about those characters. 
Then there's a second company called Shiva, which is trying to harness the power of the monsters in a way. Uh, they have their own power or they're finding their own way to destroy them with this uh, device. And then the third company is the, I think I wrote it down wrong, but it's the Masai Koku, which also has a secret. That And that Masai Koku company is a subsidiary of the Shiva, which was basically the creator of it, um, owned the two companies. So it's a little convoluted. And then some characters are really quickly introduced and then you're not really given much explanation of who they are and they're, they're referenced several times. So I feel like this show probably deserves 26 episodes because with 13, I mean, it's very condensed and good, but at the same time, you kind of forget who some of these characters are or you don't know until later. Like, even when I was writing notes, like, I couldn't remember, keep up, like, with some characters, so. But there's a lot of good callbacks to the old show, too, like the first uh, movie of Godzilla in 1954. I like like one of the weapon designs is reminiscent of the oxygen destroyer from the original movie. So right here, you remember what this is. This is what was used to kill the first Godzilla. So in this, in the anime series, there's a weapon that also looks like this, but uh, it's got a different function. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, my closing thoughts on the show is, but if you like science fiction and you like Godzilla, I mean, I I think old school fans might have a hard time getting into it with the anime aspects. But for me, I think I could get in if I could get into it, they could probably too and appreciate it for what it is, because it does a lot better job with these characters and then the plot within even some of the original Godzilla movies. I mean, let's be honest, like it's not like every single Godzilla movie had a great plot. I mean, usually it was kind of the same formula, right? So this one's at least trying to do something a little different, which I appreciate. They're using the source material for something good. Like the American movies, for example, uh, they did a good job of like, doing a a rehash of it, I guess, but they didn't really do anything new. Like the Kong versus Godzilla movie was probably the closest thing to doing something good with the series. Otherwise, like the first two were just kind of like fan films. I mean, the first one was a lot different. I liked that one. Uh, Godzilla vs. King of the Monsters where he fights Ghidorah. That one was more or less kind of like a regular Godzilla movie. So this anime, it's like, it's kind of like goes in that Shin Gojira direction where it's like taking it in an interesting route with science fiction and horror. But this time, this one's kind of mixing like folklore, science fiction, horror. It's not too gory. There's not too many gory scenes. There's a few disturbing scenes, but nothing like out of the ordinary, I guess like something teenagers I think could watch. So uh, it's coming out on June 24th. And if you're really interested in watching it now, you can just use a VPN or something and watch it on Netflix with English subtitles. I'd say give it a, give it a try. It's intriguing. It's thought provoking and it can be hard to follow, but does the source material right and it pays homage like all the monster sound effects are from the original series something i loved and appreciated from shin gojira sometimes it didn't always fit but in this it fits perfectly the way they use it even the music they have the classic godzilla movie uh godzilla music and it works out perfectly even it's a slightly modified rendition. And then they also have other music 
that goes with the other monsters as well. Uh, there's a few monsters I won't spoil that come in that are, you know, it's fun to see them. Others, it's like, oh, really? That's what you're doing? And then there's a new monster that's, uh, I don't know. They explain it. It's not that interesting. I don't like the design that much, but it looks all right for the design. It, it falls in line with the other design of the other monsters, but uh, definitely, I'd say Godzilla's singular point. If you're interested, definitely give it a watch. Once I see the last episode, I'm going to talk about the plot of the whole series and get into that. So I don't think I'll do that live. I think I'll do that pre-recorded. This one is a little distracting. I think next time I do a live podcast, I'll plan it out a little bit better, make it a little bit more interactive. So uh, until next time, thank you guys for listening. Bone Salesman out. See ya. Thank you.